This is Duke University. Welcome, everybody. We know there's still some people joining, but um, we're going to get started here with our, with our panel discussion this morning on the revolutionary practices of black photographers. I'm Lou Brown with the Forum for Scholars and Publics, and we have worked closely with Professor Rebecca Stein, the professor of the course Human Rights on Camera, which is part of Duke's first year focus program. It's a seminar class or a seminar cluster on human rights. And Rebecca reached out to us, Professor Stein reached out to us to, uh, to uh, coordinate on putting together this great panel of, um, of activists, artists, um, photographers, and visionaries. So uh, we're really grateful for all of you here. Um, thanks to the FOCUS program for additional support for the event. Our moderator for today is Dr. Anita Bateman. She's an independent curator and art historian who specializes in modern and contemporary African art and the art of the African diaspora with additional interests in the history of photography, black feminism, and the role of social media and activism in contemporary art. She earned a PhD in art history and visual culture and a graduate certificate in African and African American studies from Duke an MA in Art History from Duke, and a BA in Art History from Williams College. She's held curatorial positions at the RISD Museum, the Williams College Museum of Art, and the Matt Nasher Museum of Art. Her research has been supported by the American Council of Learned Societies, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, and the Social Science Research Council. Bateman is from Memphis, Tennessee, and is currently living in Providence, Rhode Island. But thanks to the glory of Zoom, it feels like we're all right here together. So thank you, Anita, for, for hosting this wonderful conversation and I'm passing it over to you now. Thank you, Lou, and thank you to the Duke Forum of Scholars and Publics, as well as my interlocutors today, to today's panelists, Dara J in Jamaica, as well as Professor Rebecca Stein. Um, I'm just gonna read briefly sort of an introduction before introducing our first panelist. And before each presentation, I'll introduce the panelists. So don't worry, everyone will hear about these wonderful folks' biographies. Um, so let's begin. The recent accelerated engagements with blackness and calls to action can be construed as disingenuous at best and harmful at worst exposing anxieties of whiteness to perform care while it enacts epistemic violence. Lest we forget, the camera began as a mechanism of colonial surveillance and the subsequent refusal of black subjects and photographers to engage in the practices of surveillance resists the tangible proof logic seated in the colonial project. Another contention is that the camera has been branded as a technology to raise awareness undergirding the idea of responsiveness that has taken precedence over the safety and sanctity of Black life. The fixation on Black death is yet another deployment of white supremacy in the white gaze, both systems whose sense of urgency demands to be accommodated. So in addition to the questions that prompted this panel, which is, you know, what is the power of the camera's gaze and the position of Black photographers in fights of social justice, there's also the question of how do non-Black people decouple their need to bear witness to Black death with the ethical and moral imperative to take action. In addition to this question, we'll unpack how do we evaluate the success of social justice movements outside of visuality and spectatorship. Today's panelists are Black photographers who are claiming visual sovereignty over race narratives and within their respective practices. And within those respective practices, they are reframing the relationship of history and trauma to the medium, as well as joy and love to the photographic image. And now I have the immense pleasure of introducing our first panelist, Jamaica Gilmer. Jamaica Gilmer is a relentless hope architect, strategist, storyteller, photographer, and curator. She is the founder and director of The Beautiful Project, an arts collective that centers Black women and girls as the authorities over their own narratives. Jamaica hams the Beautiful Project's curating and organizing efforts in partnership with families, organizations, and institutions. A graduate of Howard University's John H. Johnson School of Communications, she is a highly influential speaker sharing insight across the nation as a guest lecturer, keynote, and panelist. 
She is the lead curator of TBP's most recent exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art called Pens, Lens, and Soul, the story of the beautiful project. For the past 20 years, Jamaica has used images to document the breadth of vision and sight of revolutionaries and organizers. The range of her visual storytelling can be found at www.jamaicagilmer.com. Thank you, Anita. You are lovely. Okay, share screen, see if I'm gonna win. Um, it is, uh, I'm very grateful to be in this conversation. Um, today, I'll jump right in. Um, I have recently working with like, um, I, I really, really, really enjoy working um, in relationship with other artists. Um, and one of my dearest friends and I meet weekly to talk some things through as artists. Um, and in those conversations, I um, was able to name myself, as Anita mentioned, as a hope architect that shows up in my work, um, for all of my work, um, photography specifically. So this first image is of my mother in 2002. My mother um, passed away maybe, I guess about 18 years ago now. Um, but before she passed, I um, started to dive deeply into uh, the dark room. And um, this, when I thought of how um, important hope is to me um, and how I um, try to build worlds that um, center hope, I thought of my mother and I thought of this moment um, when I photographed her. And uh, I think at the time, uh, Tyra Banks had said to smize, and it was a running joke um, amongst our, like my peers. We just found it incredibly entertaining. And so I told my mom to smile with her eyes and she burst out laughing and then she looked at me. Um, and this was the image that we got. Now, after she passed away in the chaos of, of grief, I lost all of the negatives um, and all I had was the contact sheet. And so this is a scanned, enlarged, edited contact sheet um, because I just could not let it go. And I couldn't let go of that moment between us. When I showed her this image, uh, she said, is that me? So that my mother's a gorgeous woman, my mother was very confident, but that was her first response, is that me? I said, oh, mama, yes, this is you, this is how I see you. Um, it, it, it was a gift uh, that I could move her in that way. Um, years later, there's uh, the first uh, Ford Promise Youth Convening. Um, it was the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Youth Convening. I've, I've photographed in many different ways. Um, I love portraiture, I love documentary, um, but I have, uh, documented philanthropy in so many ways for a lot of years. Um, this is Jamal and Javon. There, I encourage you to go look them up. Um, they are amazing spoken word artists. And what I love about them is how they sync their breathing. At this point in time, this was a, this was a, um, this was a moment where it was a, a lot of um, young men and boys of color um, for a week together to kind of explore um, their identity and how they want to move in the world. And the reality was when these two young men um, got to the front of the stage, they started to breathe and they put their body in sync and you saw their chest breathe, going up and down and you saw their breath. And that's how they started. Um, and it was dark and it was lovely and it was emotional. And um, they completely, completely captured the room um, in ways that gave us space to grieve collectively um, and peace um, as we kind of honored those who had been killed and were no longer with us. Um, so I think photography, um, is in, can be a very intimate experience. It is a very intimate experience um, for me, and it is a call and response um, with anybody who 
allows me um, to photograph them. The heart of um, me is a love and infatuation um, with uh, Black women and girls that began because of my um, very intense and deep affection and loyalty to my sister and my mother. Um, and so the beautiful project, I have the um, immense privilege of directing beautiful. Um, when I started back in the day, um, we started with something called the Black Girl Triptych. The Black Girl Triptych um, focuses on a Black girl, asks her questions about her beauty um, and how she views herself, asks her peers questions about her beauty um, inside and out, and asks her um, uh, caretakers the same questions. And then we would take the um, quotes, create images, and present it back to the girl and her family. Um, so this was one of the first triptychs that stuck with me that I photographed. And um, these two little girls are best friends. One of the questions we ask um, is like, when is your friend the most beautiful? And um, the young lady on the right who's looking at me said when she's not mad at me, when she's not angry with me. And it made um, her best friend burst out laughing. And as little girls, they had this secret, no words conversation that they were not about to let Miss Jamaica into. <laughs> that they were going to talk later about, girl, what? Like, what are you talking about right now? And so I love the intimacy that could happen, the layers of it. Um, as time went on, me and other fantastic artists that I have had the privilege of working with over the years um, decided it was very much so imperative to teach what we were doing. Um, and so, so we how we talk about the beautiful project is we use um, photography writing and care to create space for ourselves um, as we were quietly figuring out how in the world like what was the content of the exhibition for the met this culminating exhibit this dream moment to let the world in on what our journey was we wanted to figure out what was the image that was going to communicate soul. When we say pen, lens, and soul, we're talking about um, pen, writing clearly, lens, photography, and film, and soul, our heart, our body, our mind, our space, the, the, the um, ability to really be a container of um, care and hope for each other. And so um, these two folks are very, very dear to me, very, very, um, I just, I adore them. Denise is the mama um, and Jaden uh, is the daughter. And I was so pleased when I showed um, one of my beloved colleagues, Erin, at the Beautiful Project, um, this image, it felt like um, soul to her. Um, and she was the one that was directing and holding that space at that time. And so uh, this image is the background image in the exhibit at the Met when the soul description, um, the soul section of the exhibit um, uh, to explain it. So uh, this image is one of my favorite in all the world that I took. This is Mama Tony and Sakara. I've known them a very long time. Um, they are exceptionally kind to me and um, supportive of the beautiful project and the hope back when we would have events and the snacks weren't quite right. <laughs> when we would, um, when things would go exceedingly well, if I, whenever I ran into them, they were just, um, they were lovely and they were, they were honest and we had been hoping to work together. Um, we tried a long time ago and, and, and it, it wasn't time, but I circled back to them again before um, the exhibit um, and in support of our journal. Um, uh, the Beautiful Project has a journal annually, and this was one of the covers I really, really, really love to organize through storytelling. And one of the pleasures of organizing through storytelling is to um, uh, both lead and follow. And so the creative director of The Beautiful Project now um, is Kayla Deans, um, formerly an intern in 2011, um, and won um, 
of the amazing editors um, for the journal. The reality is that in this organization that I founded and have the privilege to direct, I had to pitch and I loved it. And I pitched hard, I pitched hard. And so I went up in front of Kayla and I showed her all these images. I showed her this image, but this was not the image I was trying to pitch. And she was like, go back, go back, go back. And so I went back like really quiet, really calm, because I'm very, very um, happily uh, boisterous. So I stayed uber calm. And she was like, that one. And so I turned it black and white and I slowly turned it to her. And I was like, based on your response, I think this may be the cover of the journal. And she was like, I agree. And so it's one of my pride and joys and community and collaboration um, to both lead and follow and that um, uh, I had someone with me who could see better my portfolio at that moment better than I could. So uh, this is Tomas. Um, Tomas is, um, he's one of the amazing uh, leaders, um, directors at La Placita Institute um, in New Mexico. Um, when I first became a mother, uh, I had the immense privilege of traveling um, with a team of writers and another filmmaker for Frontline Solutions to go around the country and document um, and create stories that kind of capture the truth of uh, men of color um, doing amazing work um, and really make sure that the in intimacy and um, love and how they were organizing was captured in images. And so um, La Placita, the, their central um, goal is to have like cultural restorative justice. And Tomas, um, I grew very fond of him um, because of this quote. Um, he says, uh, we, are, we, we are who we serve. Um, Change is not an easy thing to do. It really isn't. You might fall 158 times. I'm going to be there 159 because I know one day you're going to get it. Um, this is Albino um, uh, with uh, one of his former students that he wasn't expecting. Albino is the executive director um, and also quite lovely and kind um, in creating space, um, not only for um, the young men and the children and the men in his community, um, but for us, we walked with him that day. And so, uh, as you can see, they, uh, they let me in um, to this beautiful reunion, uh, just like the two little girl best friends, two little black girl best friends um, earlier. Um, this was one of those moments when we arrived at La Placita where Albino was explaining um, the way that they cherish their land and um, what they were doing with their land to make sure that their people had access to it. Um, our whole team, there was a hush that happened. Our whole team um, was so kind of moved and impacted. Most of what we um, captured um, was us kind of like one, one knee to the ground at different times. And so Albino um, remains, if you were to run into him, um, that's the experience you would have with him. He'd be very, very moved. Um, so lastly, I, this is, um, these are some very, very, very dear friends of mine. Um, this was from this year um, during the uh, quarantine, um, and call this one Hope Protection. Um, this set of friends is, is very, very dear to my family and just support us and love us very well. And um, in a way that was incredibly moving, um, they reached out to ask, uh, my friend specifically Nikki reached out to ask a group of us to um, do a baby shower parade. And we said yes. And it was one of those moments where no one had seen anyone. And um, it was very hard and it was very sad. Um, but in the midst of 
uh, um, Nick um, and Nikki going through um, about to give birth during a global pandemic um, as a Black woman. Uh, she created this moment that we all got to celebrate and be with her. And it, it lifted them, but it lifted us. Um, and it was like a bomb. So folks drove past so many cars, um, so much beeping, so many presents. Um, my fa one of my favorite moments was when um, Nikki said, uh, maybe the drummers will come. We can ask the drummers to come. Um, and they did. And so uh, folks put on their masks. Um, folks put um, presents on the table. Folks stayed away from my friends um, so they could stay healthy and made our way, you know, to their street to celebrate. And they danced. It was lovely. Thank you, Jamaica, for sharing those moments with us. Um, like your project, those, I know there is some um, hesitation to call things aesthetically pleasing or beautiful, but I really think those black and white images of your friend, Nick, and you know her baby parade are really beautiful. Thank you. So next we have Jay Simple. Jay is a visual artist from Philadelphia and currently resides in Pamplin, Virginia. He's a visiting assistant professor of photography at Longwood University and founder of the Photographer's Green Book a resource for inclusion, equity, and diversity within the photographic medium. Working through photography in a variety of mediums, Simple examines historical and contemporary effects of colonialism and white supremacy within the context of the United States. He holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from Columbia College, Chicago, a Master of Liberal Arts from the University of Pennsylvania, and a Master of Fine Arts in Photography from the Rhode Island School of Design. He has he has had, excuse me, recent solo exhibitions at Hampton Sydney College and Longwood University and group exhibitions at Candela Books and Gallery, Franklin Street Works, Longwood Center for Visual Arts, Jamestown Art Center, and Clamp Art. You can view his work online at jsimple.com. Thank you, Anita, for that introduction. Uh, I Oh, really good to be here today with all of you all uh, on this on this occasion to discuss some of the things um, that are going on I think maybe in the world and how they affect sort of the visual medium and photography so I'm I'm thankful for the forum for scholars and publics and Duke University for having me here um, and um, yeah so I'm going to show some some images um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I sent this presentation. Oh, I guess I have to share the screen. That would probably help. Um, I sent my presentation and like what I was planning to talk to uh, to Anita like a couple weeks ago. I think it was, and um, it's kind of funny story. But I sent her like a paragraph, and I, I just always like appreciate that the thoughtfulness that you put in things because she responded back like a full couple pages full of like <laughs> in-depth analysis of like what I was saying. I was just like, dang, I didn't even like, it really started having me start to think, right? And um, so some of that I was thinking about yesterday, trying to figure out what exactly I was going to talk about. Um, and so if I can, I would like to start by, um, let me start. That look okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, start with something that I was thinking about last night and wrote down. It's a bit of a rambling, but well, I guess I have the floor, so <laughs> you guys get to hear it. All right. Um, and so I was thinking about these ideas of uh, violence, right? Of uh, displays of violence and sort of like these ideas of them being normalized. Um, in today where we see, you know, police brutality on a regular basis um, and really trying to consider what those images do or don't do. 
So I was thinking about, uh, and I'll just write it, read it. Uh, when we think about displays of violence against others, we have to consider a few things. First, to understand that the other is defined by those who do not benefit or align themselves around the beliefs of white supremacy. White supremacy is a system of the 1%, a collection of the wealthy with the most political and social and economic power. They press among the populist ideas of race and class and gender, all of which funnel people into alignment at times against their will, but nevertheless an alignment that make the richer rich and the poorer poor. This is to say that the poor white people have no more power than poor blacks outside of the social belief and benefit that they are considered white. But that desire to be socially connected leads a majority of our population with a conscious or unconscious belief that the other is subhuman. To this end, they can look at those who look like the other, then are can look at to this end, they can oh, what is that? To this end, they can look at those who look like other than them and watch them suffer and die with detachment. At some point in time through photography, we believe we could show the horrors of the world and change it. This was the goal sometimes of the photojournalist who goes to the worn torn areas of the world or the places impoverished by violence and poverty and goes to try to tell those stories and bring them to the world. What this idea forgets is that the white populace shared images of lynchings by male, like the hunters with sport. They have been desensitized to view black pain. When I think of this, I think of what privilege. Ignorance is surely some form of bliss. These images in the contemporary do nothing for a desensitized population who sees violence but doesn't see the reasons for the violence. Desensitized they don't even bother to make any inquiry. inquiry. Grotesque doesn't properly point to the systemic violence, which is a thousand deaths, which accumulate in the final blow by the hands of the states, its vigilantes, or by the mercy of God. They don't know this. By the time they hear my voice, I've died more lives than they've seen taken on their screens from the comfort of their couches, their homes, their government, their systems. It's 3 a.m. I should probably go to bed. And so I was thinking about the ways um, in which we think about violence against uh, Black people and Black bodies. Um, so to start off, this is an image uh, of a project that I'm working on called Exodus Home, where I'm traveling uh, back to places that were inhabited uh, during or through the Great Migration. Um, and thinking about uh, what happened during the Great Migration, right? So we're having uh, millions of Black people fleeing the South from uh, violence, right? Violent prosecution. Um, in the same way that we see um, today, right? They escaped to the North in these major metropolitan cities. And then now in the contemporary, those same places are uh, sites of violence by the state, by its vigilantes. And so when I go to these places, right, these just houses that are decrepit, they're tearing, tearing down that, you know, aren't even being preserved, I see within them a level of violence, right? And so what I'm trying to really kind of point at is that the sites of mundane violence which occur regularly, so that when we think about uh, and see, right, um, these horrendous acts of violence against Black people uh, by the police, uh, where we're being killed constantly, we have to understand that that is one of many ways which violence is enacted upon Black people on a regular basis. And once we can start understanding some of those pre, you know, those moments leading up, can we understand exactly what is occurring when we see those images? And so I start to think about through time, you know, the ways in which um, growing up Black in this country, you have to begin to understand how violence is used against you uh, on a regular basis. And this is learned at a very young age. This is an uh, image of me and my daughter at a Civil War, Revolutionary War uh, Museum in Atlanta. 
right? And I just start to think about how like, as she's going to be growing up and as she learns about her history, right, in terms of the United States, it is automatically going to include her having to come to terms with violence being acted upon people who look like her. And if she's growing up in the America that I know today, she's also going to see how that is still occurring today, right? We talk about generational trauma, right? Generational trauma, I don't think, is this like abstract idea. It's literally being able to look at history and see how the same things repetitively happen to people who look like you, right? And that, that at starting at that point, right, starting at, at having to understand that as what, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old, right? That to have to imagine and rationalize that is sort of like that initial violence which occurs to black people, right? That's, that happens far before we see these killings on, on the news and you see these images, they've been dealing with this level of death and violence since they were children. Even forms of labor, Right, like when we think about labor as, as black people, there is a lot of violence which incurs that. Right, you can think historically all the way back to enslavement. You can think about sharecropping and the sort of getting black people into debt as a way of uh, keeping them into subhuman, you know, positions. Um, and you can think about it all the way up till today, right, where we see. Um, uh, discrepancies in the ways in which people are hired. One of my favorite stories, um, Jay Simple is uh, a, an alias that I use, right? Not my real name. And what's kind of funny about this is that, um, not funny, but when a few, many, many years ago, not many, right, four or five years ago, um, I was working in New York um, as a, a photographer and I was taking images for like ad agency, or not ad agency, but modeling agencies and such. Uh, and I would email them my work under my normal name, right? And they would never respond. And I read this study about the ways that white people look at names and understand what they're going to be able to like accept. And so I said, you know, I'm gonna try something. And I changed my name to J Simple, which is like the most non-name that I could think of. Um, and I, I would start getting a plethora of responses and people would show up and they'd be like, oh, you're black. Right. And it, it, it was funny because even black people would come and they'd be like, oh, I thought you were just a, a white guy that shoots a whole bunch of black people because we just never go to black photographers. Right. So, again, right, I can link that back to, you know, being a young man coming out of undergrad, going to apply for jobs and people telling me you have too many black people in your portfolio. Like if you can show me that you can shoot white people, I will hire you, right? So these are, again, the violences which occur even in the ideas of making or getting a livelihood for yourself, right? Um, so I just wanted to show this, so just talk a little bit about practice, but these images I then take and make transfers of them on top of like burlap sacks, right? And I'm really interested in this idea of how to make, right, these histories and these past uh, tangible uh, objects that we can hold and think about and, and sort of analyze. Um, we can think about, right, domestic spaces, about, right, again, that ability to uh, provide for your family, right? So when you are denied a job, you're denied the ability to give your offspring the opportunities that you may see other people giving their children, right? Um, and so that is, again, right, this, this generational trauma which gets uh, passed down where people have to grow up in particular situations, right, simply because of the ways in which we think, right, race and class, right, and all these things uh, should determine who gets to have and who gets to have nothing. And of course, if you haven't, haven't kind of gathered from sort of my feel, I'm, I'm critical right, of, uh, of our systems of governance, right, and, and the way that we think about governance is, is violent, right? Um, now, of course, we can think about it in terms of, uh, you know, police brutality, but there's also these other really subtle things that occur all the time, which we have to really start to, to understand if we're going to look at those images, right? And so what if, this is an image of a uh, celebration of George Washington crossing the Delaware River, um, which was like this decisive moment in the Revolutionary War, right? And so 
out in Pennsylvania, they have this celebration of it where they get all these boats together, right? White guys get in colonial outfits and they, they row their boat across the river and everyone cheers. It's a ton of people, it's surprising, all right? Um, but I always found this picture interesting because um, it's this news crew, right? And they're like recording this guy who's pretending to be George Washington, talking about the great feats that he's about to go and embark on, right? And how he's about to liberate people while simultaneously he was a, a brutal tyrant who enslaved people, right? Like this man was an enslaver. And still, right, to this day, right now, he is celebrated as a person who believed in freedom. These contradictions, right, are constantly built into the ways in which governance is normalized, right? It's not just simply that, you know, Black people are being killed and that's normal. Like, no, like it begins at a very more ingrained root, right? And so this ability to say things and be total contradictions, right, continues to have an effect on the ways that politics work today, which like that, that allowing for uh, them to record a guy dressed up pretending to be George Washington and that he's great, like also feeds into how you can have a person like Trump, right? Who, who embodies that same idea of constant contradictions where they support white supremacy, right? But at the same time, try to say that they're for freedom and for betterment. Right? And of course, this is just ingrained into the, the, the iconography of, uh, of the Americas. Um, I find this, so I, I work a lot with archival images. This is like one of the weirdest pictures that I, I've recently found. Um, but like, it's just like, it's so emblematic to me of like, what is white American political like beliefs? And it's like violence, right? And it's like clanhood and like all this purity stuff that's happening, like all that stuff is just so much ingrained into uh, society. And then what happens is that citizens, right, uh, who, who, who have very little or often nothing, right, they grapple or they hold on to that white supremacist ideology and they start to espouse it, right? They start to mimic what the government does. And these are, are um, white power posters that were uh, made in the early 70s um, that I got in uh, an archive at uh, VCU, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, and I started to like remake those uh, posters and how to sort of fold them back onto themselves, how to use uh, the power in which they were meant to enact to really say uh, something a little bit differently. And I like really, right, like, I like to play with a lot of uh, sort of the archive and how it can be remade or re-looked at for the benefit of those who it usually denies uh, remembrance of. Right, and so, I mean, it can, be, it can be such really small mundane things, right? Like a sign outside that you're driving down the street, you're having a, a grand old day. And if you have an understanding of American history and you drive by a place that says Lynch Station, you just, you just were, were subjected to a violence by the place in which you live, right? And so it doesn't have to be, right, again, the death of a person to see the violence which occurs. You can't even drive down the street, right? You can't even walk down the street to talk about your liberty and your, your desires for freedom without being subjected to the violence of white supremacy, whether it be by the state or whether it be by its vigilantes or its believers in what it is. All right, and so even the ways in which we memorialize or try to talk about the history of what has occurred in this country, even those sites are not free of violence, right? A site commemorating, right, and talking about a life that was taken due to racial violence is then also constantly subjected to violence, right? And I wanna end on, uh, on this picture, I guess, picture or installation photograph. Um, because we're here, right, we're speaking to Duke University students today. And so it's important for you while you're, you're going about your studies um, 
and trying to learn about the world and better yourself to remember that even the spaces that you are in right now in this Zoom call are violent, right? And I always think about this, that education is one of the most violent spaces that there are because education is where people learn to enact the violence, where they learn how to think of other people as subhuman, right? And so um, this is an image of uh, a, a sculpture that I made. Um, and so in, in, in Farmville, uh, where the university that I teach at is located, they were a part of Brown versus Board of Education, right? One of that, you know, hallmark case to end segregation. And as a part of that, um, once they decided to desegregate schools, um, the county decided to close all the public schools for five years instead of desegregating, right? And so I was really thinking about, um, so I took the, the, the court documents that they used to show that the schools were unequal. And I took, uh, you know, both the, like the filings and the images evidence and collaged them to this uh, old school bus. And I was thinking just about how this idea of learning, of sitting down in a classroom is consistently uh, for black people, a, a site of enduring very subtle and often obvious violences, right? Like when you're going through your university, look at how many black professors you have, look at how much curriculum is centered on these more diverse uh, topics, right? Is it just this panel or is it the consistent ways in which you're learning, which consistently doesn't centralize uh, Eurocentric white supremacist ideology, right, into your very fundamental ways that you're learning? And you're at Duke University. I told somebody I was teaching at Duke, I was, I was lecturing at Duke University. They're like, holy crap, Duke is like a real school. And I was like, yeah, but. You, you have to realize that even within these institutions, the most privileged institutions, the more privileged that they get, the more they tend to be ingrained in these ideologies. And so I guess I just want to end uh, with, with, with telling you all that um, as you're, you're seeing all these things being brought to you uh, on a daily basis that show uh, violence in a very uh, grotesque way on a consistent basis, wonder a little bit why you only get that. Why do you only get right, the, the outward expression, the most obvious expression of the violence that occurs, but you are not receiving the information on a regular basis about why these things are happening and how there are systems set up around you to continue these forms of oppression. I wonder why that is not a part of your regular conversation every day. That like, wonder if you came to this class, right, you're, you're, a lot of you all are freshmen, if you came to this class not understanding what I'm talking about, Ask your parents why they never taught you these things. You and your experience in your life is going to be, if you want to be you know, more informed, you're going to have to, to push a little bit against the things that are going to make you a little, that would allow you to be comfortable. All right, well, that's where I'll, I'll end uh, today. Thank you all uh, for your time. Looking forward to more conversation. Thank you, Jay. And thank you for leaving us on that salient point about generational violence or what we could think of as generational violence. I know, you know, in our community, we sort of think through what it means to hold generational trauma and, and have to always see and experience, um, you know, racism. And it takes a large amount of privilege to not have to really deconstruct why it is that you as perhaps a white person don't need to think about your subject position, right? So if you're coming to this space wanting to have learned something about blackness rather than about whiteness, well, that says something about your, your viewpoint already, right? And so I think, you know, in this conversation where we're, we're sort of thinking about imagery and generational trauma and also resilience, which Dare will talk about in sort of radical love, we also need to think about generational violence and how that violence sort of gets passed down in direct and implicit ways and how we accept that violence um, in our lives uh, in various ways as well. So thank you. All right. So last but not least, we have Dare Kumolu Johnson. Um, 
And he is, uh, sorry, he, photographer Dare Kumulu Johnson graduated from Morgan State University with a Bachelor of Science in, a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. After graduating, he moved to North Carolina and worked as a software developer and tester for almost 10 years. Dare is a self-taught photographer who has been creating professionally since 2013 and casually for many years before that. In addition to his work as a photographer, he is currently a math teacher at Southern High School in Durham. He has photographed weddings, families, businesses, and events here in the Triangle, or there in the Triangle, and in multiple countries in the Americas and Africa. You can view his work online at Kumulu, uh, Kumo, sorry, kumolustudios.com. So I can go on. Can, can everyone hear me? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, that was awesome um, from both fellow photographers. Uh, I've known Jamika for a while and love her work. I love what she does with the, uh, with the kids in the area and I always tell myself one day I'm going to set up time to do the same, but it hasn't happened yet. So excellent job. Uh, just wanted to say that. And um, I'll put out a disclaimer. This is my first time doing something like this. So if I'm all over the place, try not to judge me. So, because I've always kind of stayed away from stuff like this because I've kind of uh, struggled in many ways with my photography. So I just kind of take photos, put it out there and you don't hear from me anymore after that. So, um, but, I mean, and I literally almost send a message to say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. But at the same time, I was like, hey, just give it a shot. Maybe it will be one way to push yourself over that level where you can stop struggling photographically. I mean, when it comes to photography. So I decided to do it. Um, to start off, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and uh, let me hit present. I do, I'm on Zoom all day, every day, teaching uh, students at, at a high school uh, in Durham here, Southern High School. So. This is my daily life. I mean, at least it's been my daily life for the past few weeks, a month now. Um, my name is uh, Dara Kamola Johnson. I'm originally from Nigeria. Like uh, she said, I, I've been here since 97. And uh, I always tell people, my students, my story, that I came here with uh, $200 in my socks. And I've been, been here since then. So I went to school for computer science, like uh, Anita said. And um, I'm just, going to present some of my photos and finally telling black stories my own way. Um, one of the things I, um, um, okay, before I go into saying a bit more, here's a few photos of myself um, in Nigeria as a kid with my siblings, the three of us, but we have a big family and grew up with a lot of women and uh, also grew up with a uh, Grew up with a lot of women and we were always together. I mean, my family was all, always together in my house. I always tell people, I was in Nigeria for 19 years and I only remember two weeks. That was just my mom and three of us in 19 years. The rest of the time we had people in the house. So I'm used to that. And uh, I, when I came here, I lived in Baltimore and I had some internship in New York at, uh, as a programmer. And these are a few photos of mine while, while I was in college and in New York City. I mean, this one was in New York and that was a friend of mine that we used to kind of, she used to call me husband and I called her wifey, but we were just friends. So we had fun, all, a lot of fun at Morgan State University. And this was uh, during our homecoming at Morgan, one of the years uh, we had African Students Association and we had our own parade. And also we want to show a little bit of uh, some pictures of Nigeria that I took the last time I, um, actually not the last time I was there, this was in 2013, right after I left IT World, I, I decided to, I went home that December to take some photos and just hang out with family. So here are a few photos from then. And this was at, uh, we went to the beach and I uh, decided, okay, let me get my camera and just walk around and take some photos of the people having fun. So, and this was at the same place. I love silhouettes a lot. Almost every photo shoot that I do, I somehow somewhere create a silhouette, even when it's a, 
uh, maternity shield, family portraits, I find it somewhere and just create a silhouette. And the way, I mean, the way to do it is just have that bright background and the subject is way darker than the bright background. So I always somehow, some way try to find that for every photo shoot. So it's just, I really love silhouettes. I'm, I don't even know why, frankly. So. And same beach when I was in Lagos in 2013. And this was some um, friends and I uh, buying something called suya. Suya is pretty much beef meat sold on the streets. Um, it's, if you haven't tried it before, uh, check it out. Suya is amazing. It's spelled S-U-Y-A. People sell them here also and it's outstanding. Uh, so this was uh, two of them. These two people are my friends. Uh, we went there together and I just walked back a bit, a few meters to get a couple of shots. And I see one of my childhood friends just popped up on the screen as joining the Zoom. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> That's exciting. We literally grew up together. I put this on Facebook and I just saw his name pop up. All right. So in terms of um, my history, I came here and as a, as a Nigerian, I didn't necessarily see myself as black because we're not told that back home. We just see it because it's all black people. So there's no distinguishing. Uh, separation per se. So it was when I came here that I understood what racism was for me. I mean, I didn't really get it before I came here. So for me, over the years, as I got into photography, one of the most endearing things to me is to just see the resilience of Black people here in U.S. and see their existence. I always say that the fact that Black people still exist in America is a miracle on its own, considering all the consistent harm that has been done to them and still being done even today. I mean, nonstop in different ways. I mean, so for me, my own way of uh, dealing with that is just taking pictures of black people in different ways. I mean, in the, their everyday lives to show uh, the humanity of black people. And one of the things that really saddens me is the fact that as black people all over the world, including in Africa, we have to constantly show our humanity or beg people Bad white people, please, we are here. We're humans just like you stop oppressing us. So we try to show that constantly. And to me, it's sad that we have to, but at the same time, I know it's one of the ways. So I've chosen to focus on that. I just focus on taking, I mean, showing that we are people, we are everyday people just like you, taking pictures of us in our everyday lives. So that's something I make a point and you will probably see my photography because uh, I've had a lot of people say I love the way you capture black people. And that's because that's my focus. Those are the people I dearly love with all my heart, all black people. I'm not saying I don't love all people, but to me, the pain that black people have gone through in this country and still going through every day just really bothers me. And my own way of attacking it or dealing with it is through joyful photos in a lot of ways. So. And this, I'm starting with this. This is one of my favorite photos of all time that I've shot. I love this photo a lot. And that's why I started with this. It's probably my number one photo. I just love everything about it. I was at Afropunk, which is a music festival in New York every year. I've been twice now, three times maybe. And I saw her afar off and was like, hey, can I take a photo of you? And she just turned around. Our friends kind of parted ways from her because she was talking to her friends and I got this and she loved this. I mean, there have been several um, artistic versions of this drawn by artists. So that to me has been a privilege to see that happen too. So I just wanted to start with pretty much my favorite photo of all time, personally. And again, Afropunk, a few more photos from Afropunk. Um, I mean, these are photos, every photo you see me post, of course, I dearly love and I mean, a lot of ways. I wanted to show the, this. And her, the, the lady in the middle, we became Instagram friends until today, off and on, she likes my photos. She says something in my inbox. She's based in Canada. So, and that's one of the things photography has afforded me. To, I mean, it has really helped me to travel the world and more than I could have even as a software engineer. And also it has helped, it has allowed me to make a lot of random friends because I shoot all over the place and a lot of the people become my friends. And some of them have been, have been to their houses to eat. I mean, several of my clients over the years or people I even met on the street and just took their pictures of people I've become friends with to the point where I've been to their houses 
hung out and been fed dinner over time. I love that a lot. So, and then I'll focus on black on black love. These are a few photos from weddings and engagement sessions and family portraits that I've shot over the years and I just personally love what was going on in them. And I shot this wedding here in Raleigh and I saw them doing this and I just told them, stop right there, keep doing what you're doing, don't stop. And I um, took the photos. For me, I, when I'm shooting, I tend to focus on shooting things as is. I mean, I'll pose here and there, but I do a lot of as is photo that, okay, I see something that is just happening and I just tell people, just continue what you're doing and I'm shooting on stuff. So, and this was the same couple actually here in Raleigh also. This was on the same day that this was shot. And uh, I shot the traditional wedding a few years before and then they did uh, what we call white wedding as in Nigeria, which is sad to say, that's another way of white supremacy um, being pervasive because we call as Africans or at least Nigerians, we call, we have two weddings. We have the traditional wedding, which we call traditional. And then on Saturday, we would have typically have uh, what we call white wedding, which is us, which is just like any other wedding here. So, and this was it. Well, well this was that wedding. And this is another favorite of mine. This is Nikki here F, uh, in Durham. And Jamika actually uh, showed one of her photos. The photo that Jamika presented early on for Baby Shower, Drive Through Baby Shower, was her. I uh, shot this here in Chapel Hill, and it's literally, for me personally, it's one of my favorite photos of all time that I've shot. That was her with her dad. And one thing I do always wish about this photo, I wish I got more of this guys. Uh, it's one of those mistakes uh, I, as a photographer, go through every time I'm looking at my photos. Every photo I look at, I look for what I could do better. I do that a lot, and I have a lot of notes everywhere in my house about, hey, when, next time, tell the couple, to do this next time, I'm gonna move further back. I mean, so that's one thing I do see in this photo. I wish I was further back, that way I could get more of these two dramas. I mean, especially the second one that is halfway cut. So I love, this is a very special photo to me personally. I don't think she knows that herself, but yeah. So, and then this is another engagement session that I shot here. This was in Greensboro. I actually did this a few months ago. A friend of mine went with me and uh, I love this photo. Again, for me, it's about just picturing us in our daily lives and our, with our love, regardless of the pain. So I always say to myself that in the midst of all the pain, somehow, some way, these people still find a way to laugh and smile and make things happen. So, and this was in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, an, a maternity shoot. And I uh, shot this just last month, actually. Yeah, I drove to Asheville with a friend of mine for when we were there for multiple days just hanging out and did this. So, and this was a couple here in Durham, one of my favorite couples. I've known them for over 10 years. They just did their 10 year anniversary. And I, call, I put a call out there that I wanted to shoot at any couple that was interested, and they said yes. And it happened to be their 10 year anniversary. So, the portrait just worked out perfectly for them as their 10 year wedding anniversary photos. So this was one of the photos, this was in downtown Durham. And this was a couple that found me online and called me and drove and uh, got me, um, paid for my trip to uh, Outer Banks, which was my first time going to Outer Banks. We'd never been there before, I'd never been there. So I went there, drove there with a friend and, and um, this almost did not happen because it was raining that day. They wanted photos in the sand dunes at Outer Banks. I didn't even know this existed over there. So, but it almost didn't happen because it rained all day, pretty much. But I just, and on, we were literally on our way to go take the photos at the hotel lobby. But I just kept insisting, guys, let's chill for a bit. I mean, we chilled for a bit. Then at some point decided, you know what, we're going to go for the hotel like we, as a second option. Then on our way, the rain st stopped slightly. And I honked at them from my car and said, guys, we stopping. I, it, the rain is not completely gone, but we're going to stop and make it happen. And as we were shooting, the rain completely stopped. So I shoot in the rain a lot also. It's just my thing. I don't really care what the environment is. I try to challenge myself and say, put me anywhere, and I will create some beautiful photos of Black people, anywhere you put me. So that's a challenge I give myself every time. So, and this was here in Durham. Um, 
Um, these are now friends to me. And these kids, I always, I don't have kids, but I always kind of say to myself, I've come to love them as my own kids, really. And quite often, they make me want to have kids, just seeing them with their mom out they interact. And also, just the stark contrast in their personality amazes me. I mean, one of the, she's very outgoing and will fight anybody, doesn't care. I mean, ready to fight, fight any day, anytime. But she's the older one, and she's very quiet and just kind of tries to stop her younger sister from um, doing what she's not supposed to do. So I just love their interaction. So... And another favorite, I've uh, shot her every day on her birthday for the past six years. Um, the, uh, her name is Oriana. I've shot her six years. First year birthday, of course, she cried the entire time. And then over the years, I mean, I've pretty much become family to this entire family. So I've been to their house to eat. I went there for a birthday this year also. So. And another quick uh, shot of a family here. This was at North Carolina Museum of Art, Art in Raleigh. And the dad, we used to party together back in my party days, in our party days, all of us here in Raleigh. I used to see my parties and we part I went to the same parties all the time. So it's been amazing to see that over the years I've become more of their family photographer. And this is a friend of mine's family at a town called Castalia in North Carolina. A few years ago, she, I traveled with her to a, their house. Um, to, I've traveled with her for Christmas and went to spend Christmas with their family. And I shot this uh, photo there while I was there. And um, yeah. And I have a little bit of a uh, few protest photos that I shot this year. Again, I. I don't focus too much on that personally because we, I see enough of that everywhere. That's how I see it. And I'm one of those people that frankly does not click on videos of all the violent for, uh, videos of black people being killed because I'm just like, this is exhausting. I don't want to see it anymore. It's, it's tiring. So I, I do a little bit of it here and there. So this is one photo that just really impacted me personally because it just completely depicts the pain of black people in America in the midst of all the joy. And somehow, some way they still find joy. I mean, because this is a country that is in so many ways, just pretty much in my opinion, if it was left to America, what black people would not exist anymore, at least from what I see. So that's my own interpretation. But I do my own thing by just showing a little bit of that and showing the joy and the beauty of black people every day. And again, this was from the same protest in Raleigh, as you can see. And one of my favorite events of all time in Durham, and literally actually not one of my favorite, it is my favorite. Number one event I look forward to every year in Raleigh, Durham is Black August. It was started by a group of friends in, uh, six years ago now. And uh, first year I was in Afropunk. Second year I decided no matter what I'm doing, that weekend is reserved. No weddings, no shoots. I always have to be there, no matter what. And these are some of the photos. I know a lot of the people that have talked to me love the most about my photos, because for me, again, it's about capturing Black people in their awesomeness and greatness, regardless of the pain constantly meted upon them. So, and this is a photo, I have an exhibition that is about to start with Durham Art Guild with actually Triangle Community Foundation. And it's an exhibition based on black fathers and black father figures. This is one of them. This, I shot this at Black August and I particularly just love this photo. I know people might see it and be like, what's, I mean, what's that? I just love the way he's looking up at his dad or I could call him Black Father Figure because I don't know for sure, but looks like he's dead. I love that about this photo personally, and it's one of my favorites too of all time. So, and of course, this is all in the background of people just having fun, Black people to be precise. <laughs> and again, this is also from Black August. Um, uh, these are people I've gotten to know over time. They fam the families of Palace International, um, that's what my favorite restaurant here in Durham. Um, these are family members. I saw them at Black Girls and asked for their photo. And I actually later found out who they are. So I didn't know that when I was shooting this photo, but I found out who they were later. Another favorite, 
she's there, to ask if I could take a photo and she just bust out laughing and I'm shooting on stuff. I shoot a lot of photos to get one photo that I like. I'm a, a what some people call a spray painter. You just click and click in. I see what's about to happen and I just start clicking and I look, I look through it. It might be 20 photos of her and I'm looking for just that one perfect expression of her. And lastly, these are some all the photos from Black August. And um, yeah, uh, this, uh, this is also a couple I've come to know over time. Uh, the lady I've gotten to know as she follows me on Facebook. And uh, her, uh, my, this is my friend. She actually helped me with this photo, um, with this slice. And I didn't know her when I was taking these photos. So, but we become friends over time. And she was actually part of helping. Uh, the, um, she was part of, oh, she helped me with making this slide to be precise. So, and these are just, I made some all the people uh, in downtown Durham during Black August, um, my favorite event in Durham. And I literally have thousands of photos of this, uh, from this event from over the past four years. I mean, five years now, I've been there for five years in a row. So. And that's it from me. All right, thank you, Dare. It's always good to end on a note thinking about community and, and Black love. And so I'm happy that we could have you speak about your practice and, and thinking about Black communities taking up public space and, and being unapologetic about that. And so, um, yeah, Black August. Um, seems like a great event uh, and that's during the whole month of August or just a one-time thing for those pictures you took is it like reiterative throughout the month or yeah it's celebrated the entire month but the event is on it's usually one Saturday every year in, in August gotcha. all right great so we have a few questions from Professor Stein's students uh, a couple of them are Speaking of vernacular photos, so I'm going to sort of conflate um, a few. So there's one question that's, that reads, I noticed that they, being the, the panelists, have presented a mixture of photos, and I was wondering if they think vernacular, staged, or explicitly political photography is more powerful slash effective in redefining the Black image. I guess we can start by talking about what the black image is, or I'm not sure how this person is trying to define that, but if you have any thoughts about um, vernacular versus stage photography and how that contributes to thinking about, you know, black people in, um, in public space, that, that would be a great start. I I I wonder if there are photographs of black people in public stages, public spaces which aren't already in and of themselves a little staged. I mean, the ways that uh, black people, unless they're like very safe spaces, right? Like the ways that we have to operate within public are already a, a persona, sometimes in a way. Um, so I just wonder about like that the terminology of what's staged and what's not staged in like photos, right? Like you know, you're having your photograph taken, you're already always doing a performance. But I think that, um, I think there's an inherent, but that's like my heady answer, I guess. But I think there's like an inherent, um, in, in vernacular photography, I think there's, there's always a, a nice sort of counter to just the also equally like um, vernacular images that try to degrade black imagery that has been like historically done. So I think that there's like a power in that um, that's important. I think like stage photography is like a opportunity to be able to uh, construct, right, uh, analysis or conversations about the things that vernacular photography inherently does. That mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anybody else want to tackle that? Thank you, Jay. Yeah, so um, I think they're all important, um, just in terms of like, why, I mean, 
black photographers are all individuals, but the, the tradition and legacy of black people around the world doing photography, um, all kinds of photography, um, in an intimate way can feel like it, it, um, it helps us uh, process, um, it can feel like it's um, saving our lives and it can actually um, impact um, uh, our safety um, and, and, and our understanding um, of, of violence around us and, and what's happening and that we're not crazy that this stuff is happening um, to us. And so from um, James Vanderzee, um, uh, portraits are stunning. And, and the layers of conversation that happen um, when you're looking at Vanderzee's work and how um, we have all participated in that legacy in particular. So many people who do um, uh, stage portrait, if you would, to, um, I, I was about to reach, I'm trying to keep in mind that I'm being recorded, I'm not keeping that in mind very well. Um, Roy DeCarva, did I say it right? Sweet flat paper. Roy DeCarava. DeCarava, thank you. Um, uh, sweet fly paper life, like, like, it's all important. It all tells a part of the story um, for, like, Jay, I love what you said, like, when, you know, there's so much that is, can be staged when you're interacting with a camera, um, because in order to uh, protect yourself, um, but, and there's also a, um, a moment um, that I see a lot in uh, Dari's work, where, like, you know, it's, um, he's documenting just what's happening free, but somebody can sense that camera and they, they, they hit their spot. Um, and, and so I think, I think it's all important to, to capture the nuances and um, clarity. And then um, Kennedy, uh, Kennedy Carter. Like there are so many folks. Um, I, I enjoy um, uh, Kennedy's work and how much she, uh, in particular when she's documenting um, revolutionaries and protests. She does so much in all of these traditions, um, but I think they're all important, uh, all important part of our story. Yeah, yeah, I'll say the same thing too. I mean, I think every part of it is important and uh, it kind of goes back to one of the things that, one of the conversations I have with friends sometimes where they say, why is everybody protesting and people should focus on building wealth that way we can have more power. And my answer back to friends that say that all the time is every sphere of activism is needed. Activism from wealth side is needed. Activism from protesting side is needed, from education, from all perspectives. So I think it's the same thing when it comes to photography, all aspects of it is, are needed. So that's what I think. Great. All right, we have about 15 questions in no time. So maybe we answer one or two. And, and um, if it's all right with the panelists, we'll provide your email addresses and people can email you their questions directly or and, you know, do a follow-up. Um, but penultimate question, us by, sorry, I lost it. Mm. Uh, what steps do you need, what steps do you think need to be taken to have a black archive with a black centered gaze rather than the historically white gaze imposed on the black community? And this is from Jessica. What steps do you think you need to be taken? What steps do you think need to be taken to have a black archive with a black centered gaze rather than the historically white gaze imposed on the black community? That sounds, that sounds like a heavy question. Um, let's see. I, I, if, I, if I understand it, I think the president is saying right now, or historically, images of black people have typically been created for white gays. And now how can we change that to, it's for, to the point where it becomes 
mostly black gays or black gays. I don't know. Yeah. I think that's happening already. I mean, now we have access to resources as black people. I mean, black people have access to the cameras or the frames or the equipments that only white people had access to back in the days, for instance. So back then they created images based on their perspective because it was mostly white photographers. So more than likely the audience was them. But now that we have black people with cameras doing the same thing, we have a lot of black people most of our audience, my audience is mostly black people, for instance. So the black gaze is already occurring. I mean, when, if it comes to us creating some kind of a archival department or spot for it, that's a different story. I'm not sure what we can do about that. Maybe the museums need to pay more attention to black images from black photographers and make it a point to have that in their museums more often. So I'm not sure what, I just think now we have more access. So black people have way more opportunities to look at our photos and our, uh, our, our images than they did before because we are way more in, in number as black photographers. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> It does. I think if we're coming from it, from the assumption that our, that the photos you're making already and implicitly are made for the black gaze, then I, th I think that maybe is a, a different question than making images that are for the white gaze. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what the black archive and the black centered gaze have to do with each other necessarily, if, if we're talking about that already in the work but maybe I'm not understanding the question, but if, if anyone wants to respond to thinking about black archives and, or black archiving and how that's created for black audiences, um, you know, feel free to jump in with that part of the question. Yes, so um, it's interesting. The, um, uh, some of my, the amazing artists that come through the beautiful project learn about the legacy um, of black photographers at beautiful because that's not they're not that's not something that is a part of um, uh, school curriculums um, heavily or at centered right um, and so so like Dara say like the gays you know already um, exists, uh, the reality of um, archiving and the legacy around archiving um, um, exists as well. Um, I think um, it would be immensely worthwhile to um, research Dr. Deborah Willis's work um, and uh, what she's done uh, to make sure there was, um, uh, you could find the scholarship, you could find the images, you could find the people. Um, who have black people who have not only created the work, um, but have also um, organized it, archived it. Um, and, and really around the nation, if you think around the nation, whether classically trained or um, uh, intuitively protective of our history, um, there is uh, so much kind of archiving and curating that happens in homes and then what happens publicly um, is, is documented around, around the nation. So I think um, what would be useful is, you know, like yeah, Zoom is a tricky thing. When you're looking at these, these questions, I'm, I'm wondering if we're missing a nuance of the question, but um, uh, a lot of archives around um, the work of black photographers um, and the lives of black people already exist um, and are very thoughtfully done. Um, and for those to be uh, a more centered experience in education, um, often when you go and you need to find a book pre-COVID, go into a bookstore, if it's not there, you ask over and over again for that author. So do you have this book? Do you, do you have this book? And so just a, a tactic as a student is um, not only to research on your own, um, but to ask like who else besides white people? All right, we'll do this. One last question um, from Josh. And his question is, 
Photography can be a powerful tool for human rights movements in empowering, empowering, oh God, marginalized groups. But even if a photographer approaches, sorry, every time someone writes a question, the question moves. Um, photography can be a powerful tool for human rights movements in empowering marginalized groups. But even if a photographer approaches their work with the best intentions, do you think that there can be unintended consequences that photography can have in, on human rights? And if so, how can we address these unintended consequences? I think like photography is done more bad than good. I, I'm trying to think of like what humanitarian good photography has, has generally done. I mean, I can think of like a couple of instances, but it seems that like, again, right, like a lot of times uh, photography that's meant to sort of document these situations always falls flat because photography can give no context, right? Photography can just can be a, a scene setter uh, from one angle, right, one very particular perspective. Um, but I think that what we sometimes think of unintentional thing is like the always there in the intent, which is to like, right, frame and look at something in a very particular viewpoint, right? And so we see photography uh, in these sort of humanitarian sort of needs or uh, like uh, events that are happening, photographs are taken and then they're, they're contextualized, right? This person is that, this person is this based off of those images. And in a way it always simplifies, right? Like the ways in which the news and the media uses images to try and talk about um, issues that are complex, it, it simplifies them in sound bites, which are easily digestible. Uh, but the images in and of themselves tend to, to do counter the thing that they're, they're supposed to. Um, I think that also it's just that we're desensitized to the stuff. Like we've been just like, like how, much, like how many images of horror do you see a week, right? Like they just don't, they don't do, like we're, we're traumatized. Like we're actually traumatized. Like, so we can't understand those images the same anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I, yeah i think this i think yeah you can have unintended consequences and one way to maybe reduce that in my opinion will be to actually involve black people in what you're doing let's say you know black and you take a picture of black experience more than likely you'll be taking it from your perspective and what tends to happen is at least from what i've seen is your perspective is skewed no matter how well intended you are, because you come from a, you're not experiencing what those people are going through. So more than likely your perspective is skewed. And that's why involving black people in the work you do or black artists or, and talking to them about your work before you even put it out there is important because they can tell you what could, what's wrong or, I mean, I don't want to say what's wrong. Yeah, maybe what's wrong. They can tell you, okay, that photo, to me, it sounds more about you just loving the pain of the people. I mean, it sounds more about you worshiping their pain rather than trying to change it. So I think it's just involving Black people in the work. And that's one of the things I don't see, see too often. And I hope it becomes more of a thing to see that. Because one of the things I would never forget is I always tell people this, I was in America for I've been in America for over 20 years and I still haven't seen pictures of even something as basic as Todd Road of, in African countries on TV. Paved road, just paved road. I, I, it's always negative images of Africa that you see on TV here. Thanks to social media, that's changing. But if there was no social media, people will still be extremely ignorant of what Africa looks like because that was the case till social media existed. And I think the reason why is because it was being taken from the perspective of white people saying, okay, I'm taking this picture from my own perspective to, I mean, supposedly help the people. So if I focus on the negative, I'm helping the people. But ask yourself why you're focusing on the negative. Why? Is it really to help the people or because you actually... I mean, get off on this, literally. So that sounds too blunt, maybe, but yeah. It also feels like, like maybe if you're sorry, what you're saying makes me think like maybe if you're 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 white and you're out there taking photographs of humanitarian like needs, like maybe you should be like photographing your own community because y'all are a disaster. 
like the, the things that y'all are going around the world doing, y'all need to be documented and, and talked about. Like we got like right, like right here, right here, like we we got us. We we can talk about the black experience and we can do it a lot better because when you come to it, you come peppered with all the things that got taught to you about us. So you already come looking at me as if I'm subhuman. Right. So you can't do that work. You need to like sit down and look at yourself and try to figure out why every time you look at me, you don't see another person just like you. All right. Any final words? Any final thoughts before we go our separate ways? Stay vigilant, y'all. Yeah. Get- <laughs> I think um It's that thinking around uh, photography as a mm, study. Go look up it if you want to understand the history of Black photographers. Um, research us, and 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 then you'll be able to have a dialogue and conversation with what Black people. Um, say about themselves and to each other and about our experiences. So study um, and, and, and move after studying. Yeah, I'll say the same thing. Um, get Black people involved in everything you do. I mean, create spaces for Black people and just for Black people, not black and okay we're gonna create space for black people but still be involved in it so me you don't let people create the way they really want to create if you're constantly involved even in the space you're supposed to be created for them so i think yeah like uh, jamaica said get black people involved see us as humans because we are uh, it's I, it really always saddens me that i have to say that i have to prove it i have to constantly fight i walk into a store and I have to smile more because I'm a dark-skinned black man with locks. I don't feel like smiling, but I have to because otherwise the perspective changes of who I am, stuff like that. So I just think um, it's important to get us involved in everything you're doing when it involves black people. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't do that. I was watching a show on TV with my friend's daughter recently and all of, everybody was black, white on this show, a children's show. And one of the things I brought up is part of the issue might be because we are there as black people working in that crew, but we don't have a voice. It's one thing to be at a seat at the table, it's another thing to give us a voice. We need, you need to give us a voice, not just give us a seat at the table. A sit at the table and voice to actually talk and contribute and actually get it done without you getting comfortable about what people are saying. So get, get out of your discomfort as people. And I think that's one thing I've noticed too. Every time black people say something that is so-called radical, why people get uncomfortable. And I'm like, the fact that you're uncomfortable is the reason you should know that thing needs to be done. In the midst of your discomfort, reality, there's something real that needs to get done. So, I mean, I know I'm all over the place, but that's my, find out what if there's any such thing on my side. diddle everything they just said. So. All right, great. So they've left you with some powerful thoughts and inquiries and reflections. Um, thank you all for sharing your, your photos and practices and thoughts with us. It's been a pleasure to be in conversation with you all. And hopefully, you know, these Incoming freshman students will interrogate their own subject positions after this conversation to being um, you know, more aware of their own privileges and, and their own um, relationship with power and agency um, you know, in, in productive ways. So thank you.